Hey everyone, I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Welcome to today's Rupa Live class presented by the all new Rupa University, the best way to learn about specialty lab work from industry experts. My name is Adrian Martinez, and as always, I'll be your host for this afternoon. Today, we have a very, very special guest in Dr. Chip Watkins of Sinesco, here to walk us through clinical pearls to understanding neurotransmitters for neuro wellness. Before jumping in, a couple of quick housekeeping items to go over. Everyone joining will be muted by default, but if you do have any questions, no worries, there's that Q&A button down in the menu bar and we'll host a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Immediately following the Q&A, yours truly will show you exactly how to order these tests on Rupa Health. And if you have to jump early, no worries at all. We are recording this session as we always do. And it will be available on rupaviewuniversity.com within the coming days. Additionally, I'll go ahead and send that out via email to you along with the slides. And finally, if you are a fan of this type of content, be sure to check out rupauniversity.com to get access to all the previous sessions that we have done. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Chip Watkins. Dr. Watkins earned his medical degree from East Carolina School of Medicine and completed his internship and residency in family medicine at Florida Hospital Orlando. He has a master's degree in public health, health promotion, and nutrition from Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California, with experience in both academic and corporate medicine. Dr. Watkins built a thriving integrative medical practice in Greensboro, North Carolina. His main focus is functional medicine with a special interest in neural hormonal imbalances. He is an international speaker with over 20 years of experience and has authored a number of journal articles and textbook chapters. Among countless other accolades, he joined Sinesco's International Board of Medicine in 2005, later becoming their medical director. Dr. Watkins served as Sinesco's chief medical officer and is currently lab director of NeuroLab. So with that, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Watkins. Super excited for today's conversation. I'm going to go ahead and let you take it from here. Cool beans. Thanks, Adrian. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking a little bit about neurotransmitters and hormones and neuro wellness and all kinds of fun things today. So hopefully be a good experience and we'll take away a few things that you guys can apply uh, on Tuesday, not Monday. Tuesday, Monday's the holiday. Um, so yeah. Again, my name is Chip Watkins, uh, Lab Director, President of NeuroLab uh, and Community Lab. Community Lab, we do a lot of COVID testing, kind of a reference lab sort of a thing. And the NeuroLab is more the integrated side of things. And so um, also a, a board member and AAFP appointee to the COLA Board of Directors. Now, COLA is kind of like CLIA in that it's a lab accreditation, national lab accreditation uh, board also a special government agent and member of CDC's CLIAC, which is the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Advisory Committee. And that has actually been a blast over the last um, three years or so. It really kind of just right on the edge of stuff with uh, all the COVID and all the stuff going on there. Um, also former president board chair of, of North Carolina Academy of Family Physicians. And, um, uh, you know, so I've always kind of had my foot in both worlds, kind of in the integrative world and in the um, conventional world and uh, lab for probably the last 13 years or so. But um, I'm an old guy. Yeah. Uh, 30 years in clinical, academic and private sector medicine. So been around. Um, so Sinesco, you know, got a number of divisions, um, like I say, but today we're going to be mostly concentrating on neuro lab. Um, and also talking to you a little bit about targeted nutritional supplementation. Um, and then won't talk much about community lab again, which is kind of our reference lab and uh, COVID lab. All right, so this is our lab manager, Lisa, um, tending one of her babies. Um, but we um, use, you know, I, I think cutting edge, uh, uh, ultra high pressure liquid chromatography, triple quadruple mass spectrometry, um, which I think is probably the best instrument to measure these really small molecules, neurotransmitters. And um, every run is accompanied by a control. And I think that's important just because, again, um, like in the introduction, I said, you know, I've kind of gotten more into the regulatory side over the past few years. And um, it's, you know, when I was just in clinical medicine, I thought, well, you know, send it to the lab. It's it's the lab. You know, we got we'll get a good we'll get a good result. No big deal. Um, but it is a big deal because you know. So I, I've got Sinesco doing um, you know voluntary third party quality assurance stuff. So we so like every month we'll send blinded samples to BioRad, which is one of the top uh, QA labs in the world, um, and they'll run our samples blinded on their HPLC machines and 
they have to keep in within certain limits and ranges or we lose our certification and whatnot. We've done AAFP proficiency testing and other, and I guess I would just say that um, the quality assurance piece of whatever lab you use is really important. And I want to encourage you uh, as you have time, I know we're all busy practitioners, but you know, if you can look into your lab, you know, what kind of controls do you use? Where do you get your controls from? Do you make them yourself or do you get them from someone like, oh, say Baxter International, you know, which is where we get ours. And so, I mean, and, and I would say particularly in the integrated space, you have to be, you know, be careful about your lab. Um, and again, so in terms of Sonesco, I'll tell you what the number is. You can do whatever you want to with the number, but I'm pretty comfortable with the quality of the number. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Um, all right, so today we're going to be talking about neurotransmitters and hormones, um, looking at those imbalances and how they kind of show up clinically. Uh, and then we'll explore some uh, strategies to kind of rebalance things and promote neuro wellness. Um, and then hopefully have, you know, at least a few minutes for uh, question and answer. You know, I've got 522 slides. And so yeah, how am I going to get through that in 50 minutes? I, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, but um, Hopefully no one has a seizure disorder, just kidding. Um, all right, so for me, uh, the neuroendocrine system has always kind of been the money shot. You know, if you really wanna get your patients feeling better and um, just improved in terms of, you know, all the stuff that we see uh, coming through the office door, you know, mostly fatigue or mood issues or perimenopausal issues, you know, if you wanna get folks feeling better, the neuroendocrine system is really the, the way to go because clinical complaints really do begin to show up when there are imbalances in uh, that all important system. And optimal function requires balanced neurotransmitter release and reuptake. Um, and you've got to have adequate neurotransmitter release for um, proper intercellular communication to continue. Um, if, if, you, if you don't, it can lead to a lot of the pro inflammatory degenerative diseases again, that we see every day um, coming through the office door, right? And, you know, <clears throat> optimal um, neuroendocrine health means this balance between inhibitory and excitatory. And it's really cool to have a test that you can actually see the body working really hard at homeostasis. That's one of the most fun things is, you know, things do get out of balance and the body works really hard to bring us back into balance. And so, you know, we're actually kind of helping nature uh, as we're trying to bring folks into, into balance. And that'll, I hope, make more sense as we talk a little bit more. But so, in, you know, inhibitory side of things um, helps with calm and relaxation and sleep. The excitatory side, really more energy focus, motivation. And then both kinds of those neurotransmitters really interact, uh, as we'll see from the literature, uh, with your adrenal and particularly your sex hormones. So again, on the inhibitory side, you got GABA, serotonin, glycine, you may be um, launching that in the next six, 12 months. And then dopamine kind of swings both ways, if you will. Um, and yeah, so when you have an excess of these inhibitories, you know, people are gonna be more sedated, right? They're gonna maybe have poor memory or cognition. Too little, um, Nose is itching, sorry. Um, you're gonna end up with anxiousness and sleep difficulties and, and, and probably low mood, right? Um, the excitatory neurotransmitters, um, along with dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, glutamate, PEA. Too much, again, anxiousness, sleep difficulties, mood issues, too little, you just can't get going. You know, it's just this overwhelming fatigue and. Uh, and burnout. And certainly, I, I, and I'm not saying that, you know, someone with fatigue, the only reason is because they have low excitement. No, no, there's, a, there's obviously a million reasons for all these things, which is, you know, hey, why well, they pay us the big bucks and <laughs> pay us to try to figure out these, these puzzles that walk through the door and, and figure out what we, you know, what we need to do to really help these um, unfortunate folks sometimes. Um, so a little bit about neuroendocrine testing. So we've got the urinary neurotransmitters, uh, and then salivary sex hormones and 
uh, adrenals, right? And then we give this personal analysis, personalized analysis, that's um, a result of the patient doing a questionnaire in a four point Likert scale and some of their quality of life um, questions. And then we do a correlation analysis that kind of puts the lab results, patient's lab results together with their questionnaire and then kind of gives them you know, this very personalized um, analysis, which is really helpful. Um, and then we'll suggest targeted nutritional therapy. Again, you, you don't have to use our stuff. I think it works very, very, very well and has been um, certainly vetted over the years, but, you know, and <laughs> your patients will shop you, right? <laughs> They'll, you know, I can get the same thing at Walmart for twelve ninety nine, you know, or whatever. But um, I, again, the, the formulas I think are well thought out um, and they're just really help support um, the patient in ways that I don't think you can do any other way. Um, you may be interested in this. Uh, this was a white paper I wrote uh, several years ago, and actually we just um, re-upped uh, re it this year um, on the validity of your neurotransmitter testing. 22 pages, 117 references on the medical literature. And I will also be the first one to tell you that we don't have a lot of, um, you know, 5,000 patients over five years, double blind placebo controlled study. Just don't. Um, but there are a number of um, uh, references in the literature regarding using urinary neurotransmitters and their effect on different clinical states, whether it's, you know, ADHD or, you know, um, migraines or, 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 or whatever. So there, there's a lot of information out there, but it's not put together in panels like, you know, we kind of use. But anyway, I think, I think you'll find that interesting. If you want to grab one of those, we can, we can get it for you. All right. So um, in terms of the biomarkers that we're looking at, urinary neurotransmitters, serotonin, GABA, epi, norepi, dopamine, glutamate, PEA. And then our adrenal hormones, cortisol, four-point cortisol, two-point DHEAS, and then our um, salivary sex hormones, so testosterone, progesterone, and E1 through E3, okay? And this is kind of a sample um, report. Um, it's not kind of a sample report. It is a sample report. So you can see, again, on your left there, the uh, neurotransmitters. Um, the green is the optimal ranges. Um, and that's just been over however many years we've been doing this, that people feel, they just feel better in these ranges. And then the blue is kind of your standardized uh, reference range on normal people, right? Um, yeah. And then we've got the hormones here. And I'll show you the uh, cortisol baronal rhythm curve as well. But eh, as it's kind of the stoplight colors, right? Right, green is good and yellow is like watch out and red is like, mm. um, so yeah. And, and, and you can see cortisol there, DHEA on the left and then your sex hormones in the middle. So I'm gonna introduce you to our patient for the day. Um, she is a 36 year old black female, um, fatigue, low mood, anxiousness, panic attacks, insomnia, brain fog, cold intolerance, hair loss, um, irritable bowel, PMS, minometrorrhagia, weight gain of 30, year, 30 pounds in the past 10 years. Kind of your basic family practice patient. Um, she's a G2P2 uh, fibrocystic breast disease uh, with one biopsy that was benign. Um, history of low uh, mood uh, postpartum uh, after her first child, worse after the second. We see this all the time, right? So the first child, you know, mom's a little bit moody after the baby, the second one, you know, maybe she needs medication. And the third one's like, yikes. Um, you know, it's just like these little parasites just suck all the good stuff out of us, right? I kid, but I mean, you, you do see that all the time that, you know, each with each um, progressive pregnancy, you, oftentimes women will just feel worse and worse. Um, family history on the mom's side, you know, she's got mood problems, thyroid problems on the, um, on her dad's side was more hypertension, CAD, her sister, bipolar, also with a history of breast cancer, it's a little older than her, um, and uterine cancer. Um, so again, kind of like antenna up. Um, and then uh, again, thyroid pretty common on the, on the maternal side. She's divorced, non-smoker, a couple drinks a week, um, maybe a sports drink or two, uh, and a couple cups of coffee. 
um, no regular exercise, kind of a sad diet, standard American diet. And then she's been on Zoloft for about 10 years. Um, take some over-the-counter stuff. Um, long history of low mood with PMS over the last 15 years. Panic attacks again began after the birth of her first child. She has some reactive hypoglycemia, um, seasonal affective disorder, PMS, mastodynia, uh, low libido. She's exhausted. Her blood pressure, yeah, a little on the low side, maybe. Pulse, maybe a little on the high side. BMI of 27, so she's certainly overweight. Cold hands and feet, pale coloring, thin hair, dry skin, splitting nails, um, cystic breasts, uh, and anxious demeanor. So here's her thyroid stuff, the serum side of things. So again, with your range of TSH being 0.34 to 5.6, <laughs> she's at 4.6. So, you know, uh, I like to keep folks, and you guys probably do too, you know, around two or, or maybe a little bit less. Um, free T3 is low. Free T4 is borderline low. She's got autoantibodies present. Um, she has high estradiol, high estrone, low progesterone, low testosterone, low free testosterone. Um, DHEA is kind of both ways. And then she has an elevated SHBG. So we know that um, SHBG uh, can be a surrogate marker actually for um, insulin resistance, as well as probably in her case, estrogen dominance, as you can see. So anyway, moving on. So here's her initial profile, right? We can see serotonin is low, GABA is actually a little high, um, and uh, dopamine on the low side, norepinephrine high, epinephrine's low, glutamate is high. So and you'll see this all the time. This is a fairly typical um, profile where Folks will be low, particularly serotonin, um, in their inhibitories. And keeping in mind that these inhibitory neurotransmitters are the things that actually keep the excitatories, and particularly catecholamines, in check, right? So you get low in your inhibitories and whoa, you know, your epinephrine, norepinephrine, or glutamate. And, and usually one of them, if not two of them, will kind of pop up if you've got low inhibitories. And the GABA may be a compensatorily high um, GABA. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as time goes on. So here are her hormones. Um, uh, and here's her uh, curve. So, you know, morning uh, low and being overweight like she is. I mean, another thing to think about with a low morning cortisol might be, might be, um, a, uh, a sleep study. Uh, I can't remember if she was a snorer and whatnot, but um, yeah, low morning cortisol. And then she kind of hugs the basement there along the lower side of her curve, right? Uh, and then she's kind of got that in the middle of the row DHEAS for her morning and then afternoon, it's actually quite low. Um, again, testosterone low, progesterone low, and her estrogens are, are pretty high. So serotonin. Um, also known as 5-HT or 5-hydroxytryptophan. Um, and about 95% of it's in the gut, 1% to 2% in the CNS, 2% to 3% in the platelets. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And uh, maybe more importantly, it's a neuromodulator. So it actually affects glutamate excitability across the CNS. Um, and it does so by stimulating its own receptors on the glutamate, uh, on the GABA neurons. And so if you don't have enough serotonin, you're going to have a hard time having your GABA being effective, right? Um, and, and again, particularly serotonin, but both of them together do inhibit the release of catecholamines. And low serotonin, poor mood, you know, decreased mood, poor sleep, um, headaches sometimes. Um, certainly, if you're perimenopausal, it can add to the hot flashes issues, uh, carbohydrate cravings sometimes, anxiety. Um, and so, this is a pretty common presentation of a 36-year-old woman with low mood, anxiety, Hashimoto's, low thyroid adrenal status, and relative estrogen dominance. Again, pretty typical, right, unfortunately. Um, and she has low T3 on her lab, poor T4 to T3 conversion. She has a blunted TSH response. And that may be due to low serotonin. This is a not well-known fact, but serotonin is actually very important 
for the um, release of, of TSH. So what happens sometimes is you give people some serotonin support and you'll actually kind of uncover some uh, hypothyroidism. Your, your TSH will rise because um, the hypothalamus actually needs serotonin to release TSH, which is kind of cool. And then here's her estrogen dominance, uh, which is certainly made worse by her low thyroid, right? So nothing moves in the body without thyroid. Um, it just doesn't. And so she's got this low T3, T4. She's got low uh, progesterone, low 2 to 16 alpha hydroxy, uh, alpha hydroxy ratio, which tells me she's not metabolizing her estrogen really well. Didn't show that. Uh, lab test, but anyway. And then her low DHEA uh, cortisol. So again, her, her chief complaint really coming in uh, was exhaustion, um, as well as the PMS and, PMS and weight gain, mood stuff, um, particularly worse before her menses um, and during the winter time. And so talking a little bit about adrenal fatigue here, um, she has uh, some signs uh, in her lab. So low epinephrine level, epinephrine, norepinephrine made in the adrenals. Um, and she has this very high uh, norepi to epi ratio. And the thing is, you need adequate cortisol um, in order to convert norepinephrine to epinephrine. You also need a methylator. So she may be low in her methyl uh, methylation capacity, as well as being low in cortisol. So anyway, her, her epinephrine is quite low. So, um, yeah, so your husband is suffering from a very severe stress disorder. Uh, if you don't do the following, he will surely die. Every morning, fix him a healthy breakfast. Be pleasant at all times. For lunch, make him a nutritious meal. For dinner, prepare an especially nice meal. No chores, no nagging. Oh, yes, and make love several times a week. Do this for the next year, and he'll regain his health completely. What the doctor say? Oh, you're going to die. Okay, so um, our, our uh, friend here, nor our friend epinephrine, um, works as a neurotransmitter in a hormone, and we know it most from its hormone functions, right? Blood pressure control, heart rate, energy, those types of things. Um, profound effect on metabolism, uh, with catabolism breaking down body stores of fuel, with perceived stress, you get you know glyconeogenesis. Um, uh, gluconeogenesis, glycanolysis. Um, you get this increased heart rate, metabolic rate, glucagon, sodium retention to elevate your blood pressure, your bronchioles dilate, your pupils dilate, your small art arteries and your big muscles get more blood flow in there. So you're ready for the fight or the flight, right? Um, and chronic stress mediated overactivation of epi can lead to, uh, epinephrine can lead to uh, insulin resistance. So uh, again, this is the this is the, the tiger, uh, right? That's running out of the forest at us. And, um, you know, evolutionarily, this is the effect that we have with this acute stress, right? Um, but the problem with humans is we've got this big neocortex, right? And so we perseverate on it. And it's this chronic perception of stress that really does us in. Um, there's this uh, book by a guy named Sapolsky who um, is, uh, was, um, why zebras don't get ulcers. And it's the story of, you know, lion or tiger attacks the little sick zebra or whatever around the watering hole. Um, and within a couple of minutes, the zebras are back at the watering hole like nothing ever happened. They, if they just, you know, there's the initial thing, but they know stress is over because, you know, lion's not hungry. <laughs> um, and their cortisol levels just go right down immediately. We, on the other hand, keep playing that tiger running out after us over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the literature shows that that perseveration about that is just as um, dangerous uh, long-term as the acute things, right? So um, Hans Selye uh, came up with the general adaptation syndrome and there's three phases, right? So alarm phase, resistance phase, and exhaustion phase. And the alarm phase, when the Tiger runs out of the, the jungle at you. Um, high epi, high cortisol. Humans, again, 
over the long haul can kind of develop a resistance to this where you still run high cortisol, but your um, DHEA starts to drop. Epinephrine can be variable. And then stage three is the exhaustion phase where we have low levels of cortisol, epi, and um, DHEA. And so many patients that walk through the office door are in the resistance and uh, an exhaustion phase for sure. All right, and yes, kind of goes something like this, right? You're, uh, it's a beautiful day, the wind is in your hair and you're out on the bay and uh, yikes, right? So it's that, ah, it's that acute stress that gets you. And I, I love this picture. And that's actually not the Golden Gate. So Adrian, relax. Um, that's actually in South Africa. But it's not so much the frogman on the, uh, on the ladder that bothers me. It's the, the guy in the water there that's kind of popping his head up. I'm like, oh man. And I don't know how this story ended, actually. <laughs> um, okay, so norepinephrine, epinephrine discussion, right? So um, she has a, this adrenal fatigue, and her norepi-epi ratio is 27.9, right? So um, she has the insulin resistance and blood sugar instability, reactive hypoglycemia. And again, once you get into the state, um, it kind of further perpetuates that, that sympathetic overdrive. Right, and you, you just kind of stay in this um, fight or flight reaction uh, when you've got this norepinephrine that's just really unopposed by any kind of inhibitory uh, neurotransmission. And so again, here she's got this low serotonin, right? Even though she's on an SSRI. And what we found on our um, tests is, if somebody's on an SSRI, their serotonin levels would probably be thirty percent or so higher than they would be without the drug on board. So when somebody is low on their serotonin and they're on an SSRI, that's, uh, that's low. Um, so she's, she's quite depleted. And, um, and again, this kind of drives that uh, norepinephrine um, excess. Um, and so again, that, that, that serotonin depletion really has a strong tendency toward that sympathetic overdrive. And here's our catecholamine pathway. Um, going from tyrosine to L-dopa to dopamine to norepi to epi and all the fun little um, enzymes that break all those things down into the stuff that we're really familiar with, right? Our metanephrines and uh, homovanillic acid and all those sort of things that we have tested for years for things like biochromocytoma and that sort of stuff. But I think it's really valuable to be able to measure these neurotransmitters in and of even by themselves. Uh, and so norepinephrine um, actually enters in on that perception of fight or flight, as opposed to epinephrine. It's really that hormone that kind of drives the physical symptoms of it. Um, norepinephrine is more that uh, perception of it. And again, norepi is kept under control by GABA and serotonin. Um, and norepinephrine is super important, not just for drive and mood and those sort of things, but alertness and arousal and focus um, and sleep, you need some. And again, this is all about, it's all about balance. And there's this pretty cool inverse relationship between serotonin and norepinephrine. Um, when inhibitories are low, again, norepinephrine and or glutamate tend to be overexpressed and you get the physical sensations of these uh, fight or flight symptoms, right? And anxiousness and fear and poor sleep and all that sort of stuff. Glutamate is your primary excitatory neurotransmitter synthesized by glutamine or uh, glucose, which is kind of neat. Um, and these glutamate receptors, the M NMDA, remember Naminda for, uh, for um, uh, dementia? Yeah, that it was a it was a glutamate receptor antagonist, right? So Naminda, um, and uh, and these are, are subject to excitotoxicity uh, from excess stimulation, and things like MSG and aspartame can really play into this. Um, certainly subject to dietary intake, and so when you see sodium on a food label, may not be sodium chloride, right? Uh, maybe monosodium glutamate. Um, and, and again, aspartame can play into this glutamate excitotoxicity too. So what are we doing to our kids by feeding them all kinds of like Campbell's soup or whatever um, that has tons of MSG in it? Um, and on the, on the flip side, so we go, oh, glutamate's bad. And, you know, excitotoxicity is killing all my neurons. 
maybe, but on the on the flip side is glutamate's also important for TSH to rise. So it, it again, it's it's about this balance. And glutamate, well, glutamate is um, also really important for uh, neurogenesis and synaptogenesis and neuron neuron survival. Right. So all really important stuff. GABA discussion. So her her GABA is elevated. And um, we think that turnover there is to compensate for the low levels of serotonin. And so GABA itself um, tries to balance the unopposed release of norepinephrine. Um, and so high urinary GABA may be a sign of depleted CNS GABA, representing the need for um, GABA support. Um, in other words, even though your GABA in the urine may be high, it may be overrepresented because GABA is working really, really, really hard um, to compensate for this low serotonin. Give the person some serotonin support. And I would give her actually some GABA support as well. And what you'll find is, you know, GABA kind of uh, wiping its brow going, Ooh, ah, I don't have to work so hard. That's fantastic. Um, and you'll see uh, norepinephrine come down and those sorts of things. So GABA pathway. And again, we're going from glutamate to GABA. And I kind of look at this as kind of a God thing. I mean, you know, so glutamate, the most excitatory neurotransmitter, GABA, the most inhibitory neurotransmitter. What's the difference? One carbon unit. Wow. Okay. So um, I, I don't know. I just think that's, that's pretty neat. <laughs> But I'm a nerd, so. Um, but you know, GABA, too much excitation without enough GABA inhibition can lead to that poor sleep and restlessness and irritability and anxiousness. Come to think of it, I'm not sure that's a great picture for that slide. She does not look anxious or irritable. She looks very, very happy. Um, but GABA helps induce that relaxation and calmness and helps aid sleep. And so things, GABA agonists like L-theanine, lactium for milk peptides, Wow, what a cool product that is, lactium. Um, but uh, taurine, inositol, love inositol, um, and then bioidentical um, progesterone. Uh, remember, allopregnenolone is one of the most powerful GABA A agonists we have on the planet. Um, and so using progesterone as an anxiolytic can be really helpful, even in low doses. For women, if you give it to them two or three times a day, or you could give it to them at, at night orally, um, very, very helpful for, for anxiety and sleep, particularly over age 35, as we'll see. Um, and that just kind of reinforces that point. Again, allopregnenolone, metabolite of progesterone, very important as a GABA uh, antagonist, uh, pardon me, GABA agonist. Um, depleted dopamine. So Dopamine depletion with elevated norepinephrine is often found with low thyroid. And low dopamine can lead to a lack of salience. And salience is this idea of, do I, am I able to enjoy the rewards that I get from my endeavors? Um, uh, and if you can't do that, then you have something called anhedonia. Interesting point. Many people don't know that Woody Allen um, uh, named Annie Hall uh, after you know the, the movie Annie Hall, he was going to name it Anhedonia, but somehow the producers didn't like that and they ended up with Annie Hall. So anyway, I digress. <laughs> All right, so dopamine is our catecholamine precursor for norepinephrine found in the CNS and in the adrenals. Um, motor function and posture, really important, obviously. Cognitive function, attention focus, motivation for reward. It's also a neuromodulator, particularly when uh, estrogen is involved. But we remember these guys, right? Um, so Parkinson's, you know, low dopamine, trouble with that uh, motor function and posture. All right, little quizzo here. Um, norepinephrine and dopamine may be overexpressed, resulting in fight or flight, um, anxiousness, panic, or delusional thinking when? A, serotonin is low. B, GABA is low. Three, glutamate is low. There's a full moon. Or A and B. What do you think? A and B. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, our, our excitatory neurotransmitters can be overexpressed when our inhibitories are low.
takeaway message. And uh, serotonin will also inhibit dopamine's action. And we know this because we have patients on SSRIs, right? Um, and SSRIs increase the dopamine transporter, therefore reducing dopamine function. How does that show up? In the bedroom. Um, you know, so how do SSRIs cause sexual dysfunction? Um, animal studies have shown that an increased serotonergic tone predicts ejaculatory latency by acting as an inhibitor um, at the hypothalamus level. So that's why you've got so many young men coming in and say, do you have any Prozac? I would really like some Prozac because it keeps things going longer, right? Um, but SSRIs will affect sexual desire in about 30, 50%. And, you know, here's the unfortunate story, right? So patient comes into the doc, yeah, doc, I'm kind of depressed. Oh, well, here, take this 20 milligrams of fill in the blank. I think there's 27 of them now. Um, Paxil, Prozac, whatever, uh, Celexa. Um, and, you know, patient comes back and says, oh, you know, that 20 milligrams seemed to help for a while. You know, three, six, nine, 12 months later, comes back and says, yeah, it seemed to help, but uh, doesn't seem to be at work anymore. What does the doc do? Let's increase the dose to 40. Three, six, nine, 12 months later, it's helped a little bit, but still depressed. Let's increase the dose to 80. Oh, you don't have any sexual function? You can't have an orgasm? Oh, well, you need Wellbutrin because it's going to help your dopamine. Uh, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months later, patient comes, you know, still depressed. Oh, well, you need this Abilify. And people get on this, uh, you know, this medication train, right? And all you're doing by using those higher, higher, higher doses when you, in, in the context of a low serotonin, you're, you're beating a sick horse. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult, not, not a good thing to do. So find out what they need and help try to balance them back out. All right, so these interactions. So, um, and, and listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apologize for this right now. And I, I am sorry. Have you heard of the seven doors of the menopause? Okay, itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. Okay, we're going to move on and forgive me. Okay, so in the transitional years, after about age 35, ovaries start to go, right? So uh, we get these anovulatory periods, um, no progesterone, unopposed estrogen, and we get women that are anxious and they're having trouble sleeping, right? And that's because of this progesterone allopregnenolone thing affecting GABA um, uh, activity move that out a couple more years and you get more decreased estrogen, right? And then estrogen and serotonin have this very strong um, relationship. As a matter of fact, estrogen is nature's SSRI. Estrogen is a natural SSRI. But, you know, here you start getting the fatigue and the insomnia and the migraines and hot flashes and, and mood and anxiousness and emotional volatility and some of those things that are just very, very difficult. And how many of you know too that perimenopausal women in functional medicine it was kind of my, um, you know, bread and butter because I don't think we do a very good job uh, with it at all in our country. A lot of women suffering out there and sad. So, um, you know, age 30, everything's groovy, right? Uh, we got estrogen, we got plenty of progesterone, testosterone's lower, yay, everything's great. Eh, at age 35, like I say, uh, progesterone starts dropping off. Estrogen starts to tank a little bit and testosterone drops some. We move in, move in through menopause um, and uh, testosterone becomes the predominant sex hormone actually uh, as both uh, estrogen and progesterone tank. And then finally, you know, late menopause, you start doing things like hydrolysis and removing facial hair and bodily hair to, to women because uh, those androgenizing effects of uh, testosterone if they don't have a good functional doctor. All right, so hormone effects on neurotransmitters. Estrogen, again, strong serotonin agonist and dopamine modulator. Progesterone uh, GABA agonist. Uh, testosterone serotonin agonist and dopamine agonist. DHEA um, yeah, does everything. Uh, and it's neuroprotective and it uh, increases neuronal plasticity. You have to be careful in women to give them too much, you know, and I think seven keto is probably a better way to go than just plain DHEA. Um, thyroid, definitely serotonin agonist, uh, cortisol excess, not good for serotonin, blocks serotonin. We'll, we'll go through that in a sec. Um, cortisol deficiency, um, uh, 
lowers serotonin and epinephrine, increases norepinephrine and glutamate. Too much insulin, um, you get insulin uh, or insulin resistance, decreases serotonin because of the, the blood sugar uh, roller coaster, right? We, um, as insulin goes into the cell, it takes some serotonin with it. And so over time, that's one reason we have so many people with low serotonin and so many people depressed is uh, doing the, that sugar roller coaster really not good for your serotonin levels. Neurotransmitter effects on hormones. So here we know serotonin is really important to improve thyroid function and certainly release of, of TSH. <clears throat> and again, watch for those hidden um, um, hypothyroid folks that it may show you once you start giving up some serotonin support. Um, adrenal support certainly can uh, help with uh, and, and increase cortisol appropriately. Uh, GABA will actually inhibit thyroid function a little, little bit, not as much as serotonin helps it. Dopamine um, shows decreased prolactin and increased uh, growth hormone, uh, too much norepinephrine, increased cortisol, epinephrine over a long period of time, chronic stress, you get lower cortisol. And then again, epinephrine excess can lead to uh, insulin resistance. So, and then here's um, an interesting story too. Um, estrogen can, can kind of dominate thyroid issues in a couple of ways. When you're eliciting, when you have this estrogen dominance, you're putting out a lot of SHBG. You also tend to put out more TBG. And that TBG will bind your uh, active free thyroid and make it harder to metabolize that estrogen. So it's this you know, vicious cycle, right? And there's also a competitive inhibition of estrogen at the thyroid receptor. It doesn't fit well, but it fits well enough to cause some blockages um, in binding, uh, and binding and it prevents binding of thyroid hormone to its own receptor. So both of those things together, you get lower thyroid function um, in estrogen dominance, which is again, not good. You need your thyroid to metabolize. And because of estrogen's relationship with serotonin, estrogen dominance can result in lower serotonin function. Um, and then estrogen dominance and progesterone, we kind of went through this in those um, menopause slides, but without ovulation, you get no progesterone and estrogen is unopposed all month long, right? And again, since progesterone is a very important GABA agonist and, and allopregnenolone is a very important GABA agonist, you tend to get uh, less uh, or lower GABA function. Testosterone, um, estrogen dominance here can be a problem because again, with all the estrogen, you're elaborating more SHBG. Hers again was quite high. Um, and that SHBG binds your free testosterone. So it can't bind to its own receptor anymore. And her lab, remember, showed low testosterone and low free testosterone. Testosterone is a very powerful serotonin and dopamine agonist. Uh, and therefore, with lower testosterone and lower testosterone action, lowered serotonin and, and disordered uh, dopamine function are typically the rule. Um, and again, this thyroid serotonin discussion. So she's got Hashimoto's, right? And, and we find that about 51, 50 to one ratio in women to men, um, <clears throat> about 95% of it's bound by, by uh, proteins. And so um, if you're relying on TSH alone, and this is probably preaching to the choir, I understand, but you know, without free T3 and free T4, you really, uh, and some would even argue reverse T3, you can't, uh, you can't get a really good idea of what's going on with your thyroid uh, function. So I encourage you to do the free T3 and free T4 at least. And that's particularly true uh, in light of a low serotonin, right? Remember the relationship between serotonin and thyroid. Um, adrenal discussion. So cortisol and DHEA kind of have this cool inverse relationship in acute stress. DHEA S being kind of the storage form of our adrenals drops first uh, and, uh, while cortisol seems to be rising. Um, but doing a two point cortisol can be real helpful because it can help you see how much uh, DHEA you may need and when would be the best time to replace it. So I might give this lady, you know, 2.5 milligrams um, a late afternoon or something like that because um, she's kind of flagging in the afternoon with her DHEA. Now, here's the cortisol serotonin thing. High cortisol, not good for um, adequate serotonin. So it doesn't for 
different mechanisms, at least four ways. So cortisol, um, it, it gives a functional desensitization of the serotonin autoreceptors. Cortisol significantly decreases the number of um, serotonin receptor sites. Cortisol um, substantially increases serotonin uptake. So there's, again, less around. And then tryptophan metabolism is shunted down the chirinin pathway by elevated cortisol, all right, um, by the action of uh, tryptophan oxidase, right? And so you can use 5-HTP actually to bypass that tryptophan oxygen enzyme, and you can help the patient raise their serotonin even if they're under a lot of stress and have uh, high cortisols. Now, again, all about balance. On the other side, too little cortisol, serotonin can't have its inhibitory effect on glutamate. So again, you got to have, you got to have the right amount. You got to have it kind of in the middle, like three bears, right? You know, just right. Um, so again, we have this 36 year old woman, anxious, slow mood, panic attacks, PMS, reactive hypoglycemia, seasonal affective disorder, mastodynia, exhaustion, 30 pound weight gain, low libido. She has Hashimoto's, she has adrenal fatigue, she has estrogen dominance uh, with low um, progesterone and testosterone and T3. She's got her neurotransmitter uh, concerns. She's wigging out on norepinephrine and doesn't have enough of her inhibitory stuff. Uh, dopamine is low, so she doesn't care. <laughs> um, and then she's got this really high norepinephrine ratio and needs some methylators and cortisol. That's kind of the summary. Um, and I think this kind of exemplifies that timing and sequence of, of, of doing your uh, nutritional therapy and a hormonal balance. Um, and key tip here, pro tips, always start with your inhibitory foundation first. You've got to lay down and give them some serotonin and GABA support before you start doing, even things like DHEA can be very stimulating, but certainly before you start giving catecholamine support and thyroid support and that sort of stuff, you've got to get that inhibitory um, base first. And so restore inhibitory neurotransmitter levels first, um, then you can start doing catecholamine and adrenal support uh, and thyroid replacement if, they're, if they need it. Um, and then you can also support their uh, sex hormones. And in the first year, you may do, uh, I don't know, probably or average of three tests. This is an iterative process. You know, you do the test, you look at the numbers, you do an intervention, you retest, you rebalance, you do another test, you re, you, and you, you're, working, you're working to optimize uh, your patient and get them in optimal balance. And it, it just takes some time. And so here's her uh, retest, right? She was 85 or so, now 311. Yay, actually a little bit on the high side. Um, GABA, despite giving her some GABA support, her GABA actually went from 900 down to 634. So again, that's the fact that that GABA was working so hard to try to compensate for the low serotonin. Um, and so even though we gave her GABA support, her GABA actually came down, as did her norepinephrine and glutamate. Again, these things are the things that keep these catecholamines particularly in check. Um, uh, epinephrine, because of her uh, adrenal function, improved a little bit. And then here are her sex hormones, um, really pretty good. Um, she's still uh, uh, hugging the uh, lower end of the range, but she has improved somewhat. Her uh, evening is the relatively highest uh, of the day, which may help her uh, in the end with her sleep. It's not high, right? It's in the normal range. Um, so that's all good. Her uh, DHEA has improved quite a bit, um, as has her testosterone. Um, again, this, this is with, this is not just giving her support for her um, neurohormones, but also some um, sub-Q, uh, pardon me, some um, transdermal uh, estrogen and oral progesterone. But that's for a whole nother lecture, right? Um, and then the care package, right? So here's our neuroendocrine testing. We talked about the personalized analysis with the uh, uh, patient questionnaire and then the uh, correlation analysis that puts together the lab values along with their um, questionnaire and, and makes sense of it. And that's a great thing for the patient to actually have and read. And it may generate some questions for you, I'm not saying that, um, which can be a problem if you're running behind, but um, 
you know, really helpful information for the patient. And I would also say as a practitioner, after you've done 35, 40, 50 of these things, you probably won't need to read that. But early on, it, it's actually quite good to, to read. And then we'll make the suggestions on the targeted nutritional therapies. So here's a, an example of the correlation analysis and, and education report. Again, that can be shared with the patient. Um, here's the quality of life score, the questionnaire. Um, uh, this really helps improve compliance, compliance and, can, and the patient can see their improvements over time uh, with this as, as well as the laboratory uh, most of the time. Um, and then we have the targeted nutritional therapy uh, recommendations there. Again, you don't have to use them. Um, uh, patients will shop you though. They will go to, go to Walmart or whatever. Um, but then these are our uh, uh, targeted nutritional therapy and um, they're you know, free of gluten or non-GMO, free of allergens, um, really high quality stuff. And we, we do shop the world for, um, for these ingredients. And they're, it's a, they're really good. And I think one of the really unique things about um, Sinesco's products is this NSB. Um, this is a blend of digestive enzymes um, and, and bioperin, which helps with um, GI uptake of these nutrients. And so I think if you're talking about the formulas versus, you know, again, shopping for, you know, Walmart brand 5-HTP or whatever, um, I think it uh, you, your patients really will do better on the formulas if, if you choose to do it. Remember, only amino acid precursors fill that tank. SSRIs, SNRIs don't do anything to raise the level of serotonin in the body, right? Um, they kind of plug a hole, but they, they don't do anything to raise the level. The only thing you can do that are your amino acid precursors. Oh, and I'll tell you too here, um, appropriately balancing hormones will make your neurotransmitters work more efficaciously. If you've got a pre-menopausal or menopausal woman and you're working on her hormone balance and that sort of thing, if you help her with her neurotransmitters, you won't need to use nearly as much um, sex hormone replacement, key fact. All right, and so here's our inhibitory formulas, Prolent, kind of helps with the serotonin side of things. Also some GABA. Lintra uh, is your GABA formula. Lintra is one of those things that you know works because if it's ever backordered or if you run out of it, people are wrapped around your building going, hey, where's my Lintra? And they really, I mean, it's a, it's a great, great product. And then Tranquilent um, was a little brainchild of mine. It's a raspberry flavored chewable, great for kids um, or if Folks just need a little bit of support, 20 milligrams, I think, of 5-HCP in there, some theanine, and uh, we put a gram of inositol in there, and I love inositol. I kind of think of inositol as almost a neurotransmitter amplifier um, and using the G proteins and whatnot. Um, excitatory formulas, uh, Contegra, this is your HPTA, uh, HPTA. HPAT balancing formula. So it's got a little bit of iodine in it for thyroid support and um, methylation support and a number of other things. Nothing in this world raises dopamine like Prosite D. Um, and it's got um, Mucuna purians in it, which is a bean. It's about 20% L-DOPA by weight. And uh, boy, again, it's very potent. Nothing raises um, dopamine like Prosite D. It's, it's a great product. Adaptocin for your adrenal support. You may have a favorite, I don't know, um, but check it out. It's a, it's a really, really good formula. It seems to work very well. Somni is a delayed release, a true um, delayed release melatonin. People don't get weird dreams and that sort of thing. I will also say that it either works or it doesn't. I, you know, flip a coin. Um, but it's, it's very helpful when it, when it helps, um, if it doesn't move on. Um, and then Methylmax is our methylation formula. Very helpful, you know, SAMI, trimethylglycine, a number of other things. It's so very helpful. Um, we try to uh, take these on an empty stomach because we don't want to compete with the um, amino acid chain competition thing going on in the stomach. So certainly don't take them with protein. Um, and then also start low and go slow. Um, response time, you know, sometimes people with the theanine and the lactam and the lintra, they have a great night, night one. Um, but Mood stuff, eh, usually two to three weeks, something like that. So getting started, um, as you've seen, you know, this imbalance perpetuates imbalance, but balance is possible, um, uh, as we saw in our patient. And so we can do that through the, the testing that we use. And this is some research that we did in-house um, 
uh, not uh, been peer reviewed, but um, these were folks that were medicine naive and did three rounds of uh, the testing, used our products, and you can see baseline, there's a Likert scale there on the, on the left of four to zero. Um, you know, most of these things are at least 50% better. Um, and I tell you, I mean, it's as good as any pharmaceutical I've, I've ever used um, uh, on the response. And, and this is what we knew. And it's kind of like the research kind of showed us that, yeah. And, and be happy to send you these monographs if it's something that you want. Be happy, happy, happy to do that. Um, profiles, uh, the HBAG is the uh, seven neurotransmitters, uh, cortisol, DHEA, and the five sex hormones, HPA. Um, is just the seven neurotransmitters in your four-point cortisol and two-point DHEA. True health is living well. The way to beat the, gr the Grim Reaper is to live well, um, as well as living longer. Um, but it is the art of balance and communication. Um, I think, again, that neuroendocrine system is the money shot. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Really, really appreciate y'all's attention here. Um, and. Um, I don't know, what do we got? Nothing. Oh gosh, we're pretty much straight up, but happy to try to answer some questions uh, if I can. Yeah, yeah, no worries, Dr. Watkins. That was amazing, um, so thorough. Quick question for you, do you have a hard stop at all? Um, or can we hop into to questions for a little um, uh, Do I, um, I, I, yeah, I think I'm okay. Okay, sweet. Well, we'll go until we're not okay because we got some really good questions. And, and just so everybody's aware, for those folks who uh, do have a hard stop and have to hop off, no worries. We are, of course, recording this and we will send out a copy of the presentation along with the slides in the next couple of days. So with that, let's go ahead and just hop in. So there's a number of <clears throat> neurotransmitter tests out there. Uh, you know, in, in your perspective, I guess, what is the major difference between your test and others that are on the market? Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's a direct um, measurement of the neurotransmitter. I mean, we, we use it, uh, this test in well over 100,000 patients over about 13 years. I, you know, I, I'm all about uh, innovation and change. And if there's a better mousetrap, fantastic. You know, you know, you should do your own research. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that, that's, that's fine. I mean, probably not everybody's going to land on our stuff, but we do have a pretty darn good track record. I've used this test in, gosh, probably 4,300 of my own patients. Wow. Um, and I don't know, it, it gives you a, it gives you uh, a perspective into the patient's neuroendocrine system that you just otherwise don't have. And, and I would say that that, again, neuroendocrine system is kind of the money shot for me, but uh, having the neurotransmitter piece of that, um, whichever test you want to do, um, is, is really, really helpful. And particularly for a patient, I cannot tell you the number of patients that have sat across from me and actually teared up and said, yeah. hey, hasn't my doctor done this test? I mean, I, now this makes sense. I understand why I feel like I feel. Uh, so, you know, thanks. And that's always, it's always good. I'd love to make your patients cry. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, in a good way, of course. Uh, and I think it does speak volumes, the fact that you've used this in over, you know, 4,000 plus of your own patients, um, you know, of course, speaks to just the validity of the test that that's being run. Um, you know, going back to really just the beginning, you know, people are really kind of curious uh, a little bit about just the white paper, where they can locate the white paper, as well as the, the, the report that you showed, that sample report. Is that a new report? Um, and if so, when would that one be launched? Uh, Melissa, are you on? Um, is that a question? I yeah, ask? Melissa, maybe we can hop in the chat and <laughs> everybody with those questions. Um, so, so we'll move on to the next one as Melissa hopefully was able to track that. And, and for anybody on, we can always answer this. Spot yeah, I mean, yeah, the monographs are absolutely uh, available and as a sample report. So yeah, okay, perfect. That's, that's the easy answer. Uh, How to get it. Um, we'll probably need to ask Melissa. Perfect. So is there any supplement that can be used to increase dopamine? Yeah, man. I mean, like I say, that um, uh, uh, Prosite D uh -huh. works like nothing I've ever used. Um, and 